you can strike the time for your this meeting. So, uh, first of all, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, I usually like to start to say, I know that you have a choice of talks that you can go to, so I appreciate the fact that you chose this one uh, to spend your time. Um, how many of you have been to my talks in the previous years last year? Perfect. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for showing up again. You have no choice. But for the rest of you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so as you know, I, I, I was telling everybody else, for those who didn't hear me, I had these great slides, and uh, I come in and there's no projector. So that's okay, We're, we'll go through it without the slides, but just picture the best slides in your mind and those were it. Um, also, there's no mic, but if you, you know, hopefully you can hear me. If you can't, let me know and then I'll try to speak up higher. But um, to start out with, this is the foreign rights um, discussion. If you were looking for something else, then this is probably not the one for you. Um, a really quick background on myself. I grew up in Hollywood, Southern California. I was born in Central America, in El Salvador, so I speak Spanish. Um, and so I, you know, by nature, I guess, uh, I lend, it lends itself to the fact that I'm able to speak to different people in different parts of the world. Although, frankly, nowadays, you know, English is the, uh, the global language, so you really don't need to speak a, another language in order to deal with foreign rights. Um, I have an MBA in marketing and a JD at law. Uh, and all of that to say is that, okay, it doesn't mean anything. Because, frankly, everything that we know, everything that we learn for foreign rights, and when I say we, it's myself, Mike, and everybody at the, the company, is through us doing. So the only way that you're gonna be able to do your foreign rights is by doing them. Um, nothing that I say, nothing that you read will matter unless you actually take action. Uh, what is it when you guys are, are, you know, when you're publishing your book, it gets sent, right? That's the hard part. Did I say that? Yeah. I won't yes. say that. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, so just like that, foreign rights, uh, you know, it's, it's you have to actively do it. Um, so, so, you know, what's the magic about foreign rights? The first thing that we, I want to level set is the fact that Foreign rights is really nothing, anything other than just you taking your baby, your book, right, offering it to just like, you know, I think we just had a pitch session, um, offering it to other parts of the galaxy, right? You sell in English and you probably sell here in the US and you've probably been very successful and now you want to make sure that other parts, other people who speak different languages want to see your book as well. And so um, that's all you're doing. So some people, you know, I hear, well, you know, I don't know anything about foreign rights, I don't know what it is, and I'm like, well, if you already negotiated, you know, and then you're already publishing your book, you probably well in advance, there's really not much to it other than the fact that you actively have to do some work. Um, another thing is, the thing about foreign rights that I hear concerns people is the contract. And I understand that because contracts are scary no matter what the language, right? Uh, so my goal here is to start off and talk about the fact that when you're looking at a foreign right or a contract, you gotta make sure that you have your basics in there. You know, and I think from the last time, you guys remember, maybe you don't, but we talked about Q-tips, right? And that's basically a, a mnemonic talking about what really should be in the contract. And so you wanna talk about the quantities. I'm talking about one book, two books, three books, because you might have a series, but you only wanna license off part of the series, so you have to be very specific about it. But what about the time, the term of the contract? How long is it gonna be? Uh, usually for foreign contracts, I find they're shorter, so they can be like three years, you know, sometimes three years, five years. Um, and, and I know that in English, and sometimes you have to, when you're working with a publisher, it can be seven or ten years, right? So depending on what you negotiate. Um, you also want to talk about the description of the book, the story, right? And so that's the product and the Q-tips. And lastly, you know, you want to make sure that the parties involved are described. And that's really important because some of you are publishing already. You have an LLC. Right, and so when you're negotiating a contract, just putting your name as the author, um, uh, you know, I caution, I think that you should actually describe yourself for everything that you are. You know, I am so and so doing business as. And so you see in a lot of our contracts, for example, we're LMBP and LLC doing business as LMBP and publishing. So it's always important to describe who you are as, in as much detail as possible. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody got a car who was here earlier, so sorry. There's a matchbox. And so, so you know, as much as you can, describe the story that you are licensing, because you want to make sure that there's no questions, there aren't any questions later on as to what actually the rights were. Um, and believe it or not, I'm giving you this advice, and I looked at a contract, we licensed uh, Italian rights. Fortunately, the rights came back. But when I looked at the contract, I'm like, what was I thinking? There was like no talk about, well, what happens if the publisher you know, goes under? There's nothing in that agreement. And I'm like, shame on me, right? 
There's, there was no talk about when does that book, when does the right come back. So these are really, these are learn, learnings and, and experiences that we've gone through that I wanna make sure that I share with you so you can avoid them. Um, another thing about contracts that's really important, foreign or domestic, is the fact that when you enter into a writing, some people think, well, it's in writing. That's what matters. And yes, to an extent, the writing matters, and that's why you have to be very descriptive. Uh, but also your actions matter. So if in your contract you say, for example, uh, the publisher's gonna give you an advance within 30 days, you know, and day 35, and you haven't gotten your money. And then you think, should I call them? Should I follow up, right? You know, maybe I don't wanna piss them off because they were really nice to me. And day 40 comes along, and nothing, your actions are changing that contract. Because the contract said 30 days. And, and the fact that you are not saying, hey, where's my money, means that you are okay with the individual not paying you. So you have no legal stance. I mean, if you come back and you say, well, they said they were gonna pay me in 30 days, let's assume you were to go to court. The judge would say, well, did you follow up? So why should I care? You know? So the, the message there is, this is your baby. No one is gonna care more about your baby than you. So when you're talking about your books, when you're talking about negotiating the rights, you have to make sure that you protect yourself, even if you have an agent. Um, and you know, some people talk about agents and the agents will negotiate the contracts. And um, we work with um, a couple of agents, um, you know, where agents are, are very helpful. If you don't just want, if you don't want to bother, you want to pay someone else to take care of whatever it is that you want them to take care of, it's okay. But you've got to understand that your book is not as important to them, right, as it is to you. So you really have to watch out over everything that's happened with your book, okay? Um, come in, come in. So another thing that I didn't mention earlier was that although I love to hear myself talk, I wanna hear from you. So let's make sure that this is a conversation amongst us. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now so we can start talking about them. Yeah, go ahead. Is there some contracts anywhere that, that like a template there, there are actually, and you know, I had it in my resource slide, uh, but if you don't mind, uh, send me an email afterwards, and then I'll make sure, because I, even Mike had sent me via Slack, there was an organization that printed out free templates. Uh, but it's a good question to ask, because contracts are intellectual property. So some people will take somebody else's contract, here, let me take it, and then I'll use it. Well, you're actually taking someone else's intellectual property, because whoever that attorney was, he or she was paid, to create that. Now, you know, some people will argue, well, attorneys just use templates. Okay, whatever, but the bottom line is someone was paid to deliver that product. So if you take that product and use it yourself without permission, you're actually using someone else's intellectual property. But there are some contract templates that are out, and um, you know, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why I don't have it, but I, I had it in my mind to make sure I put it in the slides that you can't see anyway, so. We believe you. you. Yeah, so send me an email, <laughs> and, and I'll get them to you. What email? Oh, my email is judith. Anderly at lmbpn.com. That stands for London, Madrid, Barcelona, Paris, and the New York. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get you the resources for the free templates. Uh, but, but in general, the foreign rights contracts tend to be shorter. Like I said, that one that we did for the Italian rights, it was one page. Which you're like, yay, but kind of like, no. <laughs> Too much is missing, so those are scary. And you, yes, go ahead. Where do we find people to negotiate with? Good question. So tomorrow, I don't know why they put the talks the way it is, maybe because I'm providing the input. But tomorrow we'll talk about a networking, you know, just how do you network, but it's a good question. That's where you start with your foreign rights. So what you usually do is you go to the trade shows. You know, we travel a lot. I don't know if you guys follow us, you know, we're all over the place. But if you can't, uh, for whatever reason, you can always go to the websites of the trade shows and you will see there are whole listing just of agents and foreign rights buyers. And actually, when you go to the trade shows websites, they usually say, what are you looking for? Are you looking to sell or buy? And they will actually provide you names. And so if you're not able to attend uh, yourself in person, you can always look up the names. I mean, this is what I do all the time. This is like my job. That's why I learn. I actually go and I research and I write and I probably don't get any answers because they're not gonna answer right away. 
But you know, you either keep on trying or, or you make sure you send out several labels and one of them will at least get back to you. Yes? Uh, what are some of the trade shows you recommend for any uh, Good question. So the Frankfurt Book Fair is really big and massive. This time it wasn't, unfortunately, post COVID, but it was still really good. London, the London Book Fair for Indies is amazing. The first time I went, my boss said, you go, I don't want to travel, you know, what am I going to go for? And I showed up the first time. Bus thrower. <laughs> the, I showed up the first time and it was all about Indies. And sadly, you know, I would go up and say, hi, I'm Judith Anderley. Is Michael here? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm here. <laughs> Literally, I, every, I, I would always say Judith Anderley and I would ask for Michael. So the next year, Michael went. And you can write, it, it's, it's indie focused. And what's happening is at it's Frankfurt. Bi it's bifurcated, right? The London big chunk of traditional, but then there's an indie area in the back where you just feel like this. You see the wave because, so London is more indie focused than Frankfurt. And yet, Frankfurt this time had a lot of indie talks and a lot of uh, you know, indie focus. Now, the definition of indie could be different because you know, there's like vanity presses, right? Yeah, yeah. There's also some companies out there that print books and they call themselves publishers, but all they do is basically, you know, you engage them it's and printing you pay, yeah, it's a printing company. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, you learn, right? You know, and still, I, let me put it this way. Jens is in here, uh, our, our German translator, but like sometimes he says, why do you talk to them? They're from, you know, whatever, and we don't know business there. And I said, because you never know. In his accent, put it in his accent. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I want to be politically correct. <laughs> so you never know. So so make sure you actively reach out, even if it says publishing or something. If it has a hint of what you're interested in, reach out, and hopefully they'll come back to you. Yes. Um, so going back to what you said as far as the contract and our actions changing them. Yes. So for the enforcement of rights, would you recommend including like a clause or something in there that says even if. Um, adherence to the timeline is strictly followed. You don't waive any rights. Would that be good? So, so contract? yes. So, so those those clauses, uh, and there's a legal term for it that I should know. Um, those clauses are basically mm -hmm. right to say we we only go with what's written, but reality, life, is that your actions are really important. And so sometimes you'll hear cases where um, they say, oh, they got off on technicalities. These are part of the technicalities in the law mm -hmm. that. Even silence, by the way, mm -hmm. can be construed as assent. So if you stay quiet over something, you know, you didn't object, that means you agreed. So it's very important for you to be active, protect your properties, protect your books. If somebody tells you they're going to pay you in 30 days, on day 31, you're like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, I looked and my money's not there. Where is it? So you actively have to make sure that you are standing and you're standing by the terms. Now, whether they do or not, you know, that's a second conversation. And at the very least, you can prove to anybody that you, you did your part, you followed up. Yes. So if you're doing a follow up and you're calling them, uh, is a verbal call as important as a written request for the monies? Good question. So the question is, is a verbal call as important, right? So it's not a matter of, of importance, it's a matter of proof. Right. Can you prove it with a verbal call? That, that's the question. Can you prove it, right? And so if the answer is, you can make a call, okay, and I said, well, I called them. Can you prove it? I don't know, can you? Did you keep a log? By the way, keeping a log is proof. And yes, those are all proofs, but it's, it's not that it's better or worse, but it's a matter of if it's in writing, that's a proof. Um, calling up and saying, hey, where's my money? And then follow up with an email, I just called you, where's my money? that reinforces what you're doing. Um, you know, one of the things, my, the mantra, and, and I think that our operations uh, people are learning is that you should always put in writing what you discuss. Mm -hmm. Always follow up with an email. I don't care if it's your best friend, because your best friend today cannot be your best friend tomorrow. It changes. Even spouses change. Not mine, but it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so you want to make sure you put things in writing. Yes? When you're doing contracts, are you trying to make the contract with them? Instead of them making it with you, just because of legal um, where the area is created, because you can say, oh, based upon the United States law code, instead of say with the Italian, um, it's the Italian court system, right? And so, are you trying to more often hold it somewhere that you can get to closer, if possible, or are you like, well, it depends if they're doing it, right? Okay. With that, do you try to engage with the lawyer in those countries to ratify it? 
So great questions, several prongs, mm -hmm. so I'll keep them straight. So the first question is, do you, do you want to make sure that you enter into a contract like in your own, it's called venue, mm -hmm. right? In, in legal speak, it's venue. Um, we ourselves, LMBPN, we say these contracts are when we are the originators. They're based on Nevada law, right? And if we get into some type of tip, we're going to go to Nevada courts. Now, if we are entering, and this is our agreement with somebody in Italy, if they sign it, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm going to be able to bring them here? I mean, frankly, at the end of the day, you know, or by the way, I'm not familiar with Italian law, right? Uh, and so, you know, what does Italian law say about one of their citizens signing an agreement with the U.S.? So it can be a little tricky. Uh, the second question was, do you get an attorney in the local base? You can, but it's very expensive. You know, at the end of the day, and this is a part of my talk tomorrow, it's not, I'm not trying to get you guys to show up tomorrow, but please show up. But no, but, <laughs> but part of the talk is going to be that it's a trust. Contracts are only as good as the people who are entering into them. And so you really, one of the things that I do, and it's a must for me, if I'm going to enter into any type of relationship, I always meet the person. Soon, it's probably because, you know, they're somewhere else, you know, unless I travel there. Um, but I always have to meet them. And if somebody is reluctant to meet you, why would you even enter into any agreement with them? And it's happened to us. You know, when somebody's reluctant, it's happened more than once. And it's like, well then, why bother? You know, and you can think, oh my gosh, because they're offering me a lot of money or anything, but you know what, it's not even worth it. So at the end of the day, life is too short. Uh, and the, 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 what you're trying to avoid is those problems. And frankly, what contracts are, now, you know, I'm biased, obviously, right? I went to school and then I have, you know, I favor the law. Uh, but all the law is, is it's just a way to try to make sure that we're on the same understanding. Because your blue could be different than my blue. I mean, you know, uh, Mike and I will talk sometimes, we're speaking to each other, and I'm saying something completely different than what he's hearing. Mm -hmm. And he takes action on what he thought, and I'm like, well, why did you do that? Well, you told me to. I'm like, that's not what I told you to do. And then when we start, you know, sorting it out, it's like, oh, he understood something completely different than what I meant. Not a creative. Creative. <laughs> yes, he extrapolates, blah, blah, blah. But, th but that's why. <laughs> yes, the reverse genius. I mean, just exactly genius. the yes, reverse. Uh, but, 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 but the written word is very difficult to confuse, right? Because it, but again, it depends on, and that's why sometimes contracts get long, because you're trying to be as descriptive as possible. And the last uh, one, the last one you asked about was, uh, I think it was uh, the clause with, no, that was the other question about the clock, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so do you get a local attorney? You could. In the country, you could. It's very expensive. Um, I, I would opt for knowing who you're dealing with. Really, just one or two Zooms, even before you enter into the agreement. Once they send you the agreement, if you have a question, you know, ask it. We've entered into agreements that say they're based on, on law in China. I don't know what that means, but you know. But at the end of the day, like I say, the contracts are only as good as the people entering into them. So I'm entering with somebody that I, think I like. The individual, we like the company. They seem like good people. So that's why we enter the agreement. Cal? Do you have a quantity unit sold that, you know, for a book or a series that, that you look at before you try to sell it? Or is it more about selling the sizzle? Good question, right? So the question is, do you sell, you know, if you have the one book, because this is an amazing book, or do you, usually agents or, or foreign rights buyers are looking for more than one book. So they are looking into series type of thing because, you know, they're looking to make money, right? And as you know, one book sells the next and the next and the next. Unless it's something really awesome, and again, this is your baby, so you're gonna think, oh, this is the most gorgeous thing there ever is. And they'll look at it and go, yeah, it's a pretty baby, but not, you know, one book. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's always a good idea to have more than one book. Um, and already, so this is going to sound obvious, but a book that has done really well, and you have a fan base following, and you're the, the better known, the better, the likelihood of you getting a foreign right. The less known you are, if you're not on social media, if nobody really knows you, your book is good, but you know, it, it less likely that they're going to actually do anything. And if somebody, if somebody says, "Oh, sure, I love it, I'll take it," you know, be wary of it. This is like, hmm. You know, you just want to make sure that you have something to, to give that is worth it, that is going to be something that they could use to sell. And, uh, and then that goes to the negotiation part, right? If you have something, you have several books, you're well known, you have following, and then they want to come back to you and, you know, give you a low advance, or they want to say, well, you know, well, 
whatever terms that are not to your liking, you know, feel free to say, hey, you know, I've got something to offer here. You know, so negotiate and make sure that you get your values worth. But also, but I've also, I've also seen the extreme where somebody thinks that they want a lot of money for it. You know, they want, so, okay, well, if you want a lot of money for it, there's not gonna be a lot of people paying. So I've, we've learned the hard way to negotiate on reasonable amounts. Because in the beginning, I was coming out and I'm like, da da da, I want a lot of money. And they would be like, okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have to temper. So a lot of, the, you have to do some research. Um, when you're researching for the people to contact, you know, the, usually the uh, book fairs have stats, they have statistics, you know, on the number of books they're sold, genres and stuff. Google stuff, because there's so much information on dollar amounts and advances, so that you can have an idea, and when you're negotiating, you, you come from a, a place of uh, making informed decisions. Yes, there was a question in the back. Oh, no, you already answered it halfway through. So. Oh, okay, good, all right. <laughs> See, I'm good. <laughs> yes? Do you have any examples of terms? Any example of terms? Uh, yes, so um, we, we license the Italian rights all around the world. So remember, contracts used to be geographical, right? But how do you keep geography on the internet? So you know, now contracts are worldwide for language. So then it'd be an Italian um, licensing the rights to our book uh, to be translated into Italian, but only for e-books or physical books. Why would I do that? Why would I limit that? Any ideas? Yes. As soon as you go audio rights, then that's also that can be movie translation. That can also be any audible. Exactly. Because you want as much money as possible for your baby, right? I mean, we're pimping this baby out. And so, <laughs> so this baby can come out. But if you give all the rights to this one individual, you know, you don't know if they're going to be able to do it or not. Now, as a publisher, we try to get all those rights. Trust me, I, I, you know, I'm on the other side. And I'll be like, hey, we want the audio rights, but we have a leg, we, LMEPN, have a leg to stand on. And the reason why I ask for the audio rights is because I'm, I'm actively negotiating for audio rights. And we made, um, I don't want to call it the mistake, but um, somebody negotiated before I, I became involved. An agreement where the author... The part of the thing. <laughs> where the author had to say, so now as an author, you believe I want to control my baby, but frankly, at the end of the day, you gotta, you got to decide. You know, Do you want to protect and control everything? Because if you do, you're probably not going to make a lot of money selling rights. Because the right buyers, you know, they want to buy something, right? They want to be able to control it. So from our side, we ask for audio rights because I'm actively negotiating audio rights. And I found myself negotiating with uh, somebody who was going to, in China, which, by the way, we're in Huawei, Huawei phones now. This is really great. I'm excited about that because before we were. Um, but then they wanted our books, the white books, which not we don't have many. And there was this one, and I have it now. All of a sudden, I go, oh, man. I said, fuck. I'm like, I've got to go look at the contract because whomever signed that agreement says the author has to. So I had to stop the negotiation, not for all of the books. I had to stop, go to that one author, try to get a hold of him, and say, are you okay if your books are licensed in audio in China? And I had to wait for the answer, and the answer was, that's a waste of time, and believe it or not, time is money. Mm -hmm. One or two days can make a difference, because these people were busy, you know? And it's like, why am I gonna hold up a negotiation? And so that's why for me, it's like if somebody doesn't wanna, you know, because they can do a better job, well then they need to keep it. But for us, frankly, it's, it's a matter of convenience, it's a matter of, if you're gonna come and publish, publish with us, know that we're actively now. Let's assume that we have your book, and I'm speaking now on the publisher side, let's assume uh, in the contract, it says that you give them the audio rights and the terms are three years. Two and a half, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I wanna do your audio, you know, and I wanna do it in, a, in another language. Can we do that? First of all, you have to have it written. But if the other individual hasn't done anything, you can go back to them and say, hey, you haven't done anything and I have a viable, buyer and see if you can get your rights back maybe you know it's it, it's it's questionable but uh, again so I think I think the point is as far as sample of uh, terms you know what's what's included what are you giving away the rights how long is it going to be for three years and then the names of the companies you know what what's the name who are they where are they located what, what kind of business it's always important to point out what kind of business they're into because even though they could be a publishing company, it could be just a printing company. So it's always important to describe the parties. You describe yourself as an author, 
right? Um, that who writes in genre, uh, how many books you've written, because in that, that's a description of who you are, not just your name. And then the companies, you also want them to describe what they do. Yes? So, um, along with us, you get a lot of Yes. We've alluded to before. And a lot of us have gotten pretty savvy at sussing that out in the US and in English speaking um, you know, countries. And might not have as much of a barometer for what's shady and what's not shady when we're dealing with translations in other countries and stuff. Other than like the obvious stuff of Googling and seeing what other books that they've worked with and just general legitimacy stuff, is there due diligence? I mean, it's, a, it's to the extent of your ability to do the due diligence, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, Googling is, you know, the best. Now, I could be Googling if they're in a foreign language because I don't speak all languages. Although Mike likes to tell people I do. I don't. So what I do is I Google Translate. I'll go to their site. Sometimes in Chinese, I don't speak Chinese or Korean or Japanese. So I'll Google Translate their sites and I'll see what they're talking about. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, I always ask for a Zoom. And if they don't speak English, then you know it's kind of like, how are you going to get to know these individuals? So, how are you? I mean, it's okay to enter into an agreement, but I wouldn't, you know, because because how am I going to communicate with you? What if things, you know, go south? I'm going to be able to come after you if I if we don't even understand each other. So if they don't even speak English or have somebody who speaks English, it's not that you're being pedantic. You know, it's not like you just need to understand. And if you don't speak their language, they should have somebody who speaks English and either you know, translate what they're speaking to you, the main person, or the main person speaks English. Uh, that's what I would advocate for. But Googling is the, there's no other way unless you actually travel to the country. Which, by the way, we're gonna do, we, I mentioned a, an agreement that we entered with a Chinese company. Like, one of the things I told them, and as I said, I'm coming to the Beijing Book Fair, I wanna meet you. They were like, oh, you wanna come to our office? Yeah, because I wanna see what you're telling me. Right, I wanna, I wanna see it myself. And then they said they know people at Tencent. Great, when I'm there, we can meet them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you know, and if they start, well, you know, then you kind of um, get it. Somebody had uh, one of the other talks I gave. Uh, they followed up with me, and they said, "Hey, this this company, you know, is trying to negotiate. They they had a, a re reasonable agreement." She says, "Do you mind looking it over?" I said, "Well, you know, I'm not acting as your attorney. I'll mm -hmm. look it over and just give you insights." And it looked, I said, "It looks pretty straightforward. The terms seem okay." But what's the first thing I did? Even though it wasn't an agreement for me, what's the first thing? What after all of this conversation? What's, what do you think is the first thing I did? I googled them, right? And guess what I found out? There were, these people were known, and there were comments, and they said, "Beware of this company." Because now, now I did, and it wasn't even my agreement. Why wasn't this individual doing that? And they had been to my talk. <laughs> So then I said, well, you know, I said, you'll recall that I said that you should, you know, do your due diligence and try to meet with these people. I said, I don't know, these are their comments. Okay. And, and sorry, but by, guess what happened? The person said to me, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, they seem okay to me, so maybe I'll go forward with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. And I was going to mention that. That right there, <coughs> the desire to have somebody like your baby is strong. And it overcomes common sense, yes. which is not so common, all the damn time. Would you just uh, talk to their other authors too, like their other author clients? I'm sorry, what? Would you just talk to their other clients, their other author clients too, and just see what, what do you think of this company that you signed with? If you know who they are, yes. If you don't know who they are, I would caution um, that because what, what basically what you're doing is you're interfering into a contract between those people. And let's assume this is just you know a scenario that okay and I, and I caution our internal people with this all the time. There's somebody here who's not here. Well, at least they were to hear me say this over and over again. <laughs> the problem is that you're interfering with somebody else's contract, and if something happens because of something you said, mm -hmm. you know this author all of a sudden goes, what what? I'm dealing with somebody shady, and tries to pull out. That company can come after you. If the interference of contract is a tort, it's actionable. And so I'm always cautious. I don't want to know about your deal with somebody else. I don't want our authors talking about our deals because there's a contract in place. And so you should always, now if you're, if it's your best friend and he or she tells you, hey, guess what? I entered into this contract and guess how much they're going to pay me and blah, blah, blah. That's up to them if they're telling you this information. 
But I, you know, trying to find out about a publishing company, um, if you're in conversation, if you're having dinner, social, that's different. But actively going and trying to say, hey, what do you think of this company and all that? Um, I, I wouldn't advocate for doing that. There's plenty of information out there for you to be able to I mean, like I said, with this company, I, all I did was Google, and I was able to find those comments. So, yes. Yes? Do your contracts generally talk about the, the quality, I guess, of the translation and dealing with changes? I, I've negotiated two foreign rights deals oh, good. in okay. my life, and the first one was a traditionally published horror novel that went to another traditionally published horror novel, and they changed the ending in Germany um, without my knowledge. And I didn't find out until I, I was trying to like translate some of the reviews, and I was like, what the hell is this person talking about? And then I had someone else, like our fans, talk to me about the ending of that same book years later, and I, I had had literally no idea what they were talking about. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I mean, I, is that something, because I, if I get something translated, I have no idea. Yes, no, so that's so, when we, when we talk about the contracts and the terms, uh -huh. and the descriptions, that's an important description to have. And yes, in, our, in the foreign, in the translation rights contracts that we have, we as a publisher with other people, we talk about the fact that we will take the book and we'll translate it, and we will not make any changes, other than it, it, something that might be required for marketing purposes, and we'll talk to the author. It's in writing. Right. We say, we will speak to the author, and we'll ask, you know, we want you to work with us in good faith, because you have to understand, um, there's certain words that don't translate. There's just no direct translation. Right. Right. And so what I, like with our people, with our translators, and because I do translations myself, what we want to get to, what you want to somebody to take what your meaning was. Mm -hmm. what, what were you intending to say? Because the words might not be direct. Um, I'll give you an example. We're doing, one, we're doing one in Spanish. The person writes in English, and he tried to be funny. He says, and then the bad guy went up to them and says, this is no bueno. Well, I'm translating to Spanish. It's not like, I got to translate into Spanish, right? It's like, what? So I did it, I did it in English. So I said, you know, in Spanish, I'm writing, then I use, you know, because, right, because then the intent of what the author was trying to do, right, is in, in the language, so. So those kind of things, but those are nuances. But changing an ending, but then, here's the caveat, was it in the contract? I, I don't think so. So, oh, but I don't, I, I think the contract is like one-on-one -on -one that you're talking about before, but it was like really short. And sure, right, it doesn't so speak to anything. It didn't say anything one way or another. And that doesn't mean that you, you, I mean, if I were you, I'd take action. If I were you, I'd say, hey, wait a minute, you guys changed my book, and we didn't agree to that. Mm -hmm. And then they could say, well, it's not in writing. And say, well, it doesn't matter if it's in writing, you know, in the industry, it's expected. I mean, I would try to argue before. That's what I was taught to do. So, yeah, I would, yeah, no, you've got you to gotta protect your big family. You know, you got to, that's not acceptable. I, not, I would tell them that. You know, and nowadays, with e-books, they can go back and change it. Print books is a little harder, right? But you know, right. yeah. But again, if it, if you're making a lot of money and it's a good ending, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why rock the boat? <laughs> yes. So uh, with the translation, uh, what generally happens when the contract ends? Good question. So what happens? It should be in the contract. Okay. Yeah, in the contract, it should say once at the end of the term what happens in our contracts. Uh, again, probably because you know. Uh, being an attorney, I make sure, I, I, we, we're not trying to cheat anybody, so I am actively looking to make sure that our contracts are fair and are open, and so we put in there that once the term ends, the author gets their rights back. And so that they can take that book and get it translated again. Now, can they use the translations that we created? No, because those belong to us. That's our intellectual property. Can the author then, at the end of the you know, year, seven year, five year term, at that end, can you take the book, you're the owner, and have someone else translate it in the same language? Yes. Can the, can the publisher take the translation and do anything with it at the no. end? No. No, because that, no, because what you're doing is you're licensing the English version to be translated. Once that license comes back to you, once the ownership of the English translation right comes back to you, that publisher no longer has a right. They have to pull that book. Is there ever the option? Only if the publisher agrees, or in some cases, in some countries, in some countries, they don't care about the publisher, they don't care about the author, they care about the narrator, and the narrator owns those rights. Mm -hmm. So in some countries, where for the translator? Excuse me, did I say narrator? I'm thinking yeah. about you. Translator. Mm -hmm. the, 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 
speaking of fake. Um, <laughs> the translator also writes in some countries. I mean, we, you know, in our contracts with our people, it's like it's work for hire, LMVPN knows our copyright, but in all reality, depending on the country, who cares what we say? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a moral. Stupid American. Stupid American, you stupid freedom yeah. fries. <laughs> <laughs> I love that when we were in France, I was telling like that. Yes. Yeah, no moral, you were going to say moral right? Yes, moral think, rights, exactly, yeah. sorry. It, it's That's moral right. It's, it's the, the, the translator owns that. And so, but, but again, at the end of the period, the translator cannot actively go and try to sell on their own, nor can the publisher, because that right, the licensing right to translate has come back to you. Uh, can you negotiate? Yes, you can always tell them, hey, can I buy it off of you guys? Well, you might sell it to you. I don't know why you would want to do that, because if because if the book is doing so well, they're going to try to negotiate with you to extend it, you know. Um, but but you can stop it. You can say no, but then your sales stop, and then you have to start all over again. So sometimes this is this is what I caution you. Again, it is your baby, and it's lovely, but think about it. it's a business. So try to remove that emotion, you know, out of it. It's kind of like when selling or buying stocks, right? Try to be objective, because otherwise you might make the wrong decision. Yes. So after those three years and you get your translation on it, yes. then would that be a good time to consider renegotiating the existing contract, perhaps for whatever the term is from? Oh, yes. Yeah. And especially if the book is doing well. At that time, you, good point, right? So the question is, at the end of the term, you know, and your book is doing well in the translation, is it a good time to renegotiate the contract at a better rate? Definitely. Good idea. Try to get more percentage. We've done it in audio. We've been able to negotiate up. Because we've been successful. <laughs> Negotiate <Yes>. down. <laughs> do, do most uh, foreign rights contracts have any clauses having to do with promotion or yes. sales or anything like that? How does that sell you? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I've seen contracts, in particular the ones in China, which at first I didn't understand, but you know these contracts were from uh, legacy contracts which means print books. So at a certain print run, you would get a, a certain money, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't know how that, I mean, just feasibly, uh, logistically, I don't know how that works now. The, the, my argument was, it's e-books. Oh yes, but you know, we have to have a certain print run. Yeah, but okay, but that doesn't, you know, I mean, the world now is digital. And so I try to negotiate and say, I don't want tiered, I want the money, let's talk about, you know, uh, in advance, and let's talk about royalties, period. No tiering, because now that argument doesn't play anymore. Unless you're in a country, I guess, that's mostly print, but those countries are very few and between. So, so yes, in some contracts there are tier, but if you're negotiating and it, it's your, you know, you want to get the best rates possible, I, I would try to stay away from that tiering, if you can. Yes, nothing else? Okay, so, um, resources. Sorry, did I hear? No. Okay, it's just me talking. Um, <laughs> resources. Um, we talked about research, and one of and like I said, please email me because how authors sell rights by Orna Ross and Helen Sedgwick. She Orna is with the Alliance of Independent Authors. If you do nothing else, buy that book. I don't think it's very expensive because I think Orna uses it as a resource for the ally. You know, yes. to membership. Yeah, uh, it's. One of the best, re you don't need to read anything else. Orna's book is very straightforward and we'll provide you like you know, some of the questions that we have. She'll talk about details of the contracts, what's required in the terms. And then she also talks about going to the book fairs and going to Frankfurt and we did that, yes. What was her last name again? Uh, Ross, so it's Orna is O-R, N is in Nancy, A, and Ross, R-O-S-S. -S and Helen Sedgwick. But if you do Orna Ross, how authors sell rights, you'll be able to find it. Yes? When you do Spanish, do you do Spanish for US and Latin America, or do you separate that? So Spanish, there's Spanish for Latin American countries, and there's Spanish, Castilian Spanish for Spain. So I don't know about the US part. Uh, but when, when we're doing it, we do it for Latin America. Um, do you do two separate ones? We don't. Uh, we don't because, frankly, I mean, with all due respect, Spain is kind of small. 
<laughs> right? Now, don't get me wrong, it's a good market, and they have a high average selling price because it's in euros and, you know, they pay more money over there. But from a quantity standpoint, I really want to go where most of the people are. Twenty-seven countries versus one. Yes. Now, now, to be fair, though, Spain is more advanced. So, you know, they have Kindle Read, and, you know, Amazon and all that. And Latin America is nascent, although now it's more, more prevalent. We started about three and a half years ago, four years ago. And I, you guys have probably heard the story, but oh, we're so excited. Because here in Gambit, famous Michael Landerly, translating it into Spanish. Mind you, I speak Spanish, but by no means do I call myself a translator. And so um, I did the first pass to make sure that chess was not chess, you know? <laughs> because in Spanish, chess is the same, you know, can be, right? You know? So I made sure the first pass, and then I took it to people. Uh, one of them was in Venezuela, somebody was in uh, Honduras, and the other one was in Colombia. So with native people, right, who could look at it and, and and, and you know, we published the books and we got all kinds of people on the Facebook page, about 300 people joining, everybody sharing, everybody liking, and it didn't sell. Mm -hmm. But that was four, four years ago where Kindle and everything was very limited. We're now gonna relaunch it and we just did audio. We licensed the audio to Tantor and they just did the first book in Spanish, which I'm so thrilled about, the audio. So it's not that we've given up, we're gonna be there, but it's still with Latin America. I know that um, Spanish movies from Spain are becoming very popular. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, so for those of you who don't speak, it's kind of like saying British English versus American English. Yeah. So it's not like they're not gonna understand each other, it's just a matter of preference, right? Except when you go to the market and you can't understand the fruits and vegetables. Exactly, mm -hmm. right, right. right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, or you know, what they call cigarettes over there is a politically incorrect mm -hmm. word here, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which Spanish do you use? Because um, Latin American Spanish, there, there are slight variations from country to country, so yes. The, well, there's like slang terms or whatever, which is Spanish do you go with? Yes, so, well, so Spanish is one language, right? Yeah. So each country, Venezuelans will call uh, something different. The, the, the language should be the same. So on this, let's say... Um, Brazil is Portuguese. Well, Brazil is Portuguese, yes. But for example, Michael Anderley, you probably don't know this about him, but he cusses a lot in his books. <laughs> <laughs> so translating fuckity fuck 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 into Spanish is really hard. <laughs> because it's kind of like, okay, I mean, we know what he was trying to say. Or one of, one of the lines was like, you little Nazi something, 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 you know. And I'm like, how am I going to translate? To, to get the gist of it, to get the funny part, you know. Or, or um, bitch, in English, bitch can be like, hey, I'm, you know, yeah. right? I'm strong, I'm a strong female, or you could be derogatory with it. In Spanish, the word for it can either mean whore yeah. or a female dog. <laughs> there's, there's no, you know, glorious... <laughs> way to use, <laughs> translate bitch. So, so, so for that, we find a word, and, and to your point, maybe the Venezuelans use a different word than somebody in Honduras and Colombia. So we try to use a word that's proper in Spanish, and then, you know, each, each country will have their own preferences. So it, perhaps when we, when we actively sell, you could probably see geographical differences maybe, but I, I, don't, I haven't heard that that's a problem in general. Because Venezuelan soap operas will do well in Colombia and vice versa. Yes, exactly. So. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, let me talk to you really quick about a couple of um, resources, websites, where you can go to PubMatch. That's P as in Peter, U, B as in Boy, M as in Mary, A, T as in Tom, C, H. PubMatch.com. That website, uh, I think you can put up uh, 20 books. Now they're charging, used to be free. Um, it's 20 books and you pay $20 a year, so that's the minimum. And basically it's a rights selling website. How effective is it? I can't tell you. And I think it's just like anything else maybe, you know, how good are your blurbs. Uh, they offer you an ability to do a sell sheet on there, like it's automated, it's really cool. We used it in the beginning and I did my first sell sheets with them. And um, I actually try to negotiate rights using their sell sheet, so it's pretty good. It's it's uh, by a group who does uh, booths. Uh, oh gosh, I should have learned. But uh, there are people who've been in the industry for a long time, and uh, and I think it's a good resource. And let's assume that you don't want to go to an agent or you don't want to do the letter work or anything. Put your book up there, and you know they claim that there's people buying rights, and I think there are. And if you wanted to, they could even have contract templates that you could populate and then you do the negotiations. And, and what they ask for, I don't think they ask for a percentage of the contract from my, from my last recollection. They just, you know, you pay for putting the books up there. So that's a resource to consider. Another one is dropcap.com, and that's Davidson, David, R-O, 
P is in Peter, C is in Charlie, A, P is in Peter, dot com. They're a rights agent. So um, I, I think she's been in the industry for over 30 years, so we met her at Frankfurt. Um, they seem to be pretty good people. We met the CEO. He seemed to be a pretty nice guy. Uh, I think they're the, the, they want, well, you know, talk to them because I don't want to quote a rate because I don't even know if that's the rate. They're pretty aggressive on their side. Of the they, they was, when we saw them, I was like, come on, you want this much? You know, don't forget, just because they say whatever, you can negotiate it, you know. Uh, but they were pretty aggressive, but they are an agent. So if you wanted to have an agency and if they were to accept your book, I see them, you know, and I, I see their, they come across and they have like Korean and writes in, um, you know, Hebrew. So they pretty much put your book out there. We're, we're considering them, we might use them. Uh, because even though I'm active and you know I'm out there pitching, having someone else show it, why not? It's another resource. Yes. What's that? Very Oh, wait! I had an alarm that was supposed to go off. All right. Well, we've run out of time, but you you have my email address. Feel free to write me and ask me any questions, and hopefully this time it's been worth it for you. So thank you. Thank you.